Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, can I check that you can see the DDU Viva practice, just the single screen? Full screen. Beautiful. Hi, everyone. Right. Well, let's try and crack through some uh, Viva practice for the DDU exam. Um, we'll go through it in sort of sequential order. So I'll start off with Ben at the top. Just quickly before we start, just again, it's just a few tips and tricks about the, the exam. So it's obviously a very clinically orientated exam. Uh, clinically orientated exam so you've got to read the stem you know i'm not going to give you a stem on someone who's a drug user with mssa bacteremia and it's not going to be about infective endocarditis right i'm not going to trick you um so it's all very clinically relevant the stem is relevant to what you're finding uh we may ask you things around that for example if someone's got infective endocarditis they might also have rv dysfunction or lv dysfunction because a thrombo or because a uh, you know, an infected thrombus gets thrown off and thrown into an LAD or something. You know, there might be something in there, but it's going to be clinically relevant in real cases. Um, the exam is meant to be for you guys who are at, you know, high level. You guys are advanced practitioners with echocardiography. We don't have to go through every single sort of slide as you would when we're doing POCUS exams. So you don't need to tell me in a parastonal long axis view that looks relatively normal. Just You don't have to go through everything. Um, having said that, you do need a formality to it, but I just described it's kind of go for the money. You've got to be talking at the level of an advanced practitioner. And, you know, I, I know it when I see it, I find it a difficult, bit difficult to explain it sometimes. Though. Um, at the end of this exam, we want to be able to past people who are extremely good at the basics. So that means, and when I say basics, I mean extremely good at that sort of advanced practitioner basics, as in you can assess volume status as best you can, you know about how to look at valves, you understand hemodynamic compromise, et cetera, et cetera. And in that regard, I guess you need to have a certain degree of confidence. You know, I don't expect you to be able to do everything with congenital heart disease, but you do have to be able to diagnose aortic stenosis well for example and that means that there is a certain degree of you know professionalism confidence efficiency that i guess comes with it um you've got to put that examiner at ease that you are at that level and that means that when you talk in the vivas you talk you know at about this cadence you know you're talking with a degree that you've got to get through this because you know there's a lot to get through but you've also got to sound professional efficient that means there's no errs, there's no ums and I, I do think it's good if you can stop talking. So, you know, each slide is approximately a minute in time. Try to get through what you need to get through in less than a minute. To, and that makes you sound more confident than maybe you might feel inside. All right. Um, you get seven to eight cases to go through in 40 minutes. The examiner, you ha we have to get you through those that, that time period. And that means that... Uh, the examiner might hurry you on a little bit as we go. Uh, don't think that that means that you're doing badly. It just means that we're trying to get you through it, okay? And if there are six to eight questions, one of them might be on general ultrasound. Uh, one or two. Uh, the last one is, as is, is, I say, the lion's share is, is echo. Uh, you've also this confidence, you know, whether, you, whether you're feeling unconfident in there, just fake it till you make it, right? Just as a, you, you're getting in there, just, please feel confident. I think everyone who's going through these exam practices, you know, you belong here, right? I, I have no doubt of your level of skill for the people who are turning up to all these lectures. If you don't get through these vivas, it's going to be because of a confidence thing. I don't think it's going to, or a presentation. It's like the exam technique thing rather than a, a knowledge thing. So you all, you all belong here, okay? Right, having said all that, let's kick off. Um, ben, up to you. Oh. So I'm just going to start off with some point and shoot questions, just a couple in there. Okay, so what walls are we looking at? Anteroceptral infralateral. Jeez, you said that faster than I can figure it out. Okay, good. All right, next one. Anterolateral infraceptral. Very nice. Okay, so you are going to be asked that in the exam, like I said uh, last time we went through this. Um, ben did that faster than I can remember. I have to always think about this diagram, right? So I start at my two chamber, and then I know that I got to my two chamber because I rotated from my apical four chamber, 60 degrees. So that's why the, the four chamber is always that anterolateral infraceptal. And then the two chambers, obviously anterior and inferior. And then I get around to my long axis by going around another 60 degrees. And that's the same as my parasternal long axis. And that's why that's the anterolateral infralateral. 
Okay, good job. Okay, uh, what's going on here, Ben? Tell me what you see. I'm not going to give you a stem. It's just point and shoot. Yeah, sure. So it's a strikingly abnormal study. Most concerning feature to me in the top uh, cine uh, is severe left ventricular and probably right ventricular dysfunction. I can't clearly see the mid and uh, apical segments of the anterolateral wall. Given the impaired systolic function, there's obviously going to be concern for thrombus up in there. Uh, RV longitudinal function is reasonable, but the circumferential function is going to be poor. There's poor, uh, the mitral valve for a sec. poor motion of the mitral valve. Uh, it looks like the uh, there's poor motion during systole, and I suspect that the uh, anterior uh, cusp is thickened. The posterior cusp doesn't look to be moving at all. When we move down to the uh, still clip in the bottom right of screen. I'm just about to play that. So, um, what do you uh, do? You expect there to be mitral regurgitation in this situation? Uh, yeah. Look, I would expect there to be mitral regurgitation because the uh, extent of disease or lack of motion of that mitral valve uh, makes me suspicious that there's going to be mixed mitral valve disease. The left atrium looks like it's enlarged. Obviously, mitral stenosis can cause that as well. Um, but I'm worried that there will be mixed mitral valve disease, not just single direction mitral valve disease. Uh, okay, I'm gonna show you that. Okay, we go. So what I can see in this color Doppler is at least severe mitral regurgitation. There's multiple features that make me think that. At least severe. Yeah. Is, there, is there a worse than severe? Extremely severe, severe. very severe. <laughs> Torrential. Torrential, oh, fair. Oh, yeah, good, cool. Torrential. So the features that have me worried on this single, uh, single clip uh, is that it's a broad jet on two dimensional uh, color Doppler. Uh, it extends down to the posterior aspect of the left atrium and extending into at least one of the pulmonary veins. There's a fair amount of color splay. Uh, and if you were to slow it down and determine things such as uh, uh, vena contractor um, and jet area regurgitant volume, uh, I feel fairly confident this would be severe mitral regurgitation. It's probably from the nature of it, whilst it looks like the posterior mitral leaflet is uh, the more of the culprit, culprit leaflet here, um, which would make it probably a Carpentier type two uh, regurgitant lesion as opposed to a, a more central lesion. What I can't see in these limited views is if it's just a complete perforation Okay, okay. Um, nice. And I, I, it probably is not a great example, to be honest, of the exam. But what I guess we were looking for here is that this is not stenotic. So it's not that thickened. But again, we we'll probably give you better images. And what this example of is, uh, particularly, I think we're seeing nasty regional wall motion abnormalities on both sides. That poor leaflet opening is likely because of poor cardiac yeah, output. Yeah. Um, and the, the big thing for me on these, this valve, when we look at it, is to pick up that we don't have any coaptation. Yeah. So, if a, a friend of mine said that was once telling me about when you he described this as being like the back of a um, a motorboat. Like if you go on one of those motorboats that go around on lakes for people to jet ski on, they've often got a sock on the back of the back of the propeller, and that sock means that when the propeller is going round, the sock opens and the water just gets streamed out. Yeah. But if someone to come near it, it, it provides a bit of protection. And he says the sock works because it's got this big kind of kind of redundant area below where the fat, the propeller is that then sort of shuts back down when there's no propeller working because yep. the, there's more pressure on the outside. And he described that to me to be a bit like the mitral valve. And I, I kind of get that. You know, normally you've got about a two to four millimeter redundancy in the mitral valve, which is actually where the leaflet tips. That right. doesn't give you any regurgitation. When you get, you know, nasty dilated left ventricle which has uh you know obviously poor function that annulus is going to dilate up and that means that that redundancy disappears yeah. and as that redundancy disappears you know you're going to get your normal uh, yeah. uh opening which would give you your central your annular dilatation gives you your central regurgitation jet yeah. the thing that's different about this one and that what i was sort of trying to you know see if you could come up with there is with the regional wall motion abnormality we wonder about tethering yeah. Okay. And if you get tethering, like we've got here of the posterior mitral valve leaflet, we can't see it brilliantly, but the lateral wall is not moving at yeah. all, really, you know, the anterolateral wall, which means you get tethering, right? So instead of the, the leaflets coming together like that normally, 
I think we've got annular dilation, and then you've got that fixing of that posterior leaflet, which means that you expect there be, to be torrential eccentric. Yeah, MR. Regurgitation, okay? So you should yep. be able to pick up, and there may be a better image, but we should be able to think that that's what we're gonna see before we've even seen that color Doppler, okay? Yep. So I think you're pretty close. I think it'd have been a pass, but you know, just um, that's sort of what I was trying to get at. That leaflet not moving there is because of tethering. You can always see that scarring of that papillary muscle. Yep. Posterior, uh, posterior lateral uh, and the anterolateral. And then you've also seen that there's lack of coaptation. All right, nice one. Um, Hassim, should we go on to you? Hassim, tell me about this uh, MCQ. That, this won't be in the exam. It's just kind of warm up stuff. Or if you've got Desh there, or even better, I'll, Hassim, I'll give you a full question in a sec. Let's start with Desh. Hi, Desh. Oh, what? Okay. <laughs> All right. But you can blame Ben. So I didn't even know you were there until Ben started turning the screen. Yeah, thank I'm you, promoting Ben. promoting education in the department. Thank you, Ben. Uh, the following is true regarding acute capillary muscle rupture from acute myocardial infarction. Only one of these is true. Which one is it? Just talk us through it. Uh, okay. okay. So talking about papillary muscle rupture and myocardial infarction, the anterior lateral papillary muscle is most likely infected. Acute MR, acute MR flow is in the opposite direction of the affected area of ischemia. Ugh. Oh, no. <laughs> this is, that's like a, like a triple negative. But like what? Um, right oh, coronary yeah. occlusion is the most likely culprit coronary artery. It is relatively benign complication. Okay, that one's definitely not true. Um, <laughs> also, yeah, it's not a benign complication, is it? Cool, so that's a nice place to start. I'll rule that one out. Uh, uh, How about start with number three? Maybe three is the next one, then we can get one and two. So the right coronary artery occlusion is the most likely culprit coronary artery. So we've only got three. I, Do you remember what's, what's special about What's special about one of the papillary muscles? Yeah. <laughs> special if it's only one of them, maybe not the other one. <laughs> They've got different kind of blood supply, which, so you've got anterolateral and you've got a posterior medial papillary muscle, right? Okay. So yeah. what is special about the, or what is the blood supply to the anterolateral and what's the blood supply to the posterior medial? Ooh, these are really good questions, Sam. Um, <laughs> all right you can you can phone a friend 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 ben right help us out mate yeah so you've got uh single you've got dual blood supply uh lad and rca to the anterolateral and you've got single blood flow to the posterior medial so you're more likely to blow a posterior medial uh pap muscle um that said it's important to remember that uh each pap muscle sends cordae to both leaflets so just because you blow a pap muscle doesn't mean you're going to completely blow a valve, like a, an anterior. Right. So is the right coronary artery occlusion the most likely culprit lesion? No. No. Excellent. So it's normally the... Uh, circ. Circ. Excellent. So uh, what about the acute mitral regurg flows in the opposite direction to the affected area of ischemia? <laughs> I have to think about You've it. You've got two right. left. Yeah. One or two, flick it high. Well, you so said acute the, papillary uh, muscle rupture. You're going to make me dance again, aren't you? So, so again, yeah. if it's rupture, that means that that's going to cause, is it going to be a flail or a prolapse if the whole muscle rupture? Yep. It's going to be a flail, right? A flail, yeah. So if that's the ischemic area, bursting your papillary muscle, blah, which way is the regurg going to go? the opposite direction nice fantastic so that's the right one i guess that's true right and as ben was saying is it the anterolateral papillary muscle or the posterior medial that's most likely affected the posterior medial good job sweet so just those two questions um <laughs> we're all about these sort of myocardial infarction stuff the next case will be about that as well hatim and it's coming your way so just remember when we're talking about mr I sort of put this little sort of cartoon together to try and demonstrate the different types of MR that we've got. And we should be able to pick this up from 2D pictures. So if it's normal, I could probably have drawn that a little bit better. It coapts, you know, with a decent overlap. If it's dilated, you get that central regurg jet because there's no coaptation, so it just goes straight back. If it's tethered, it means it's going to go in that direction because the valve can't close. 
If it's flail, it goes completely the other way. So the jet goes in the opposite direction. And if it's prolapsed, it's a bit like, you know, it's a bit like it sort of gets stuck. So that means it goes in the opposite direction as well. Cool. All right, Hatim, hopefully that makes your life a little easier with this case. 58 year old woman, met called for hypertension pre-angio. She's having, she had a massive non stemmy uh, was down having a angio and has um, hypotension in the cath area. Uh, take me through what we've got. Okay, so this is a person along X view. The most discerning feature is uh, the mitral valve. There is an ex uh, hyperdynamic motion of the uh, of the mitral valve apparatus, particularly the anterior mitral valve leaflet, and likely in that context, it could be a rupture of the anterolateral papillary muscle. Uh, I would be very. I'd I'd like to look at the color image to. Sorry, I don't know about that. So just take take me back a little bit. What, uh, so talk about the regional wall motion abnormalities in which papillary yep, muscle so, could be affected. So likely here that. Uh, I can see that there is infro, uh, inferior wall hypokinesia. Or what kind so, of wall? Sorry, give me the wall again. The inferior wall. Give me infra. So the, the, basal, the basal segment of the infralateral wall is the one that's uh, most showing the original motion abnormality yeah, in the form I think of. Some people may have called it, so you've got inferior, that's the bottom one. Some people yep. call that one the infralateral posterior. Can I just encourage yep. you? I think it's the second time we've done it. Just call it infralateral, anterolateral, infraceptal, anteroceptal, anterior and posterior, okay? Yes. Just to avoid, I think it's more commonly done like that, particularly through intensivists. Um, certainly cardiologists sometimes call it posterior and some sonographers, but I think just for clarity, just keep it at infralateral. Yep. So likely that the circumflex uh, artery, left circumflex nice. artery, would be the culprit here. Uh, uh, otherwise, muscle? Because you said so you called that, it the anterolateral. Uh, so that would be the posterior median. Very good. Thank you very much. What about the mitral valve? What do you say about the mitral valve? So the mitral valve itself, I think uh, uh, there is an element of uh, uh, malcoaptation with uh, being hyperdynamic, particularly from the posterior leaflet aspect. Yeah, good. So that would be Carpentier grade three, uh, if there will be an sweet mitral regurgitation. No. So color color Doppler is confirming my suspicion with a posterior directed jet of the uh, mitral valve regurgitation. From this view, I'd quantify it as moderate regurgitation, but I'd like to confirm it from different views. Yeah. What if I told you it was severe? Why? Why is the? Why does the? Because you said that because of this small color Doppler. Well, why is it uh, look so small on color Doppler, but it's actually severe? Uh, I think partly it would be related to the uh, decreased left particular systolic function. Yeah, anything uh, else? And uh, again, I'm not sure about the color scale. Let me check. Uh, the scale and the gain is all fine. It's just the color Doppler looks uh, looks small. Why, why is it? Why is because it of the Kuanda effect. Thank you very much. All right, here we go. What about this? So that's a personal short axis view at the mid papillary muscle level, and I can clearly see the distorted posterior medial uh, papillary muscle uh, with a uh, marked regional motion abnormality in the infraceptal wall, consistent with same findings. Any other regional? Any other regions? Uh, probably the septum as well is impaired. Uh, that would be the mid portion of the septum. Yeah, hang on a sec. Okay, so just let's get, let's get your regional wall motion have to be a bit tighter. Okay, buddy. So let's we'll talk about those, the six areas which we said, which are the infraceptal, anteroceptal. You know, there is no septal region when we're at the advanced echo stage. It's either infraceptal or anteroceptal. I guess it could be the entire septum. Then you that, can get him over saying. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, but it's not mid septum. We can't. Say, so just and, no, no, then, that would sorry. be the mid the mid segment because yeah, that's at the just, mid papillary muscle because at the yeah, three levels, really yeah i think tr try and keep it just to, to the nomenclature similar to this right so here you've got anteroceptal infraceptal and you've either got basal mid or apical segments yeah yeah so but, that's the mid segment 
Oh, sorry. I th- sorry. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I see what you're saying. I do apologise. I misunderstood. So you mean no, the no, mid segment no. of the infra septal? Uh, exactly. Segment. Excuse me. I do apologise. Th- I thought you meant the middle no. section in there. I do apologise. No. Um, and what about the other section? And when you're saying it, give me akinetic, hypokinetic, or normal, and tell me what your differential grade is. So ten percent, fifty percent, and more than fifty. So yeah. more than fifty would be normal. Between ten and fifty would be hypokinetic. Less than twenty is akinetic. And otherwise, if it's moving the other direction, it would be dyskinetic. And you call the mid segment of the infraceptal. Any other segments? Uh, and definitely the infraceptal. The anteroceptor you think is hypokinetic as well, and the inferior uh, and infralateral, because I think those are akinetic down there. I think you can I get away with hypokinetic. It, yeah, part of it is uh, dragged by the rest of the walls, but definitely the most segment would be definitely the septum across going into the anterior part and the anterior part. Interesting. I love reasonable because I, I think it's completely the opposite, I'll be honest. I think it's the inferior and infralateral that are akinetic and the septum's actually thickening pretty well. But again, I guess up we can to, talk about that. Because yeah, I think, I think, those, I think to, that area down there is done. And that corresponds with what you were seeing on the three chamber, right? So if we go back yes. to our three chamber, which is like our parasternal long axis, I mean, you told me that you thought it was the infralateral the segment that was exactly. akinetic. Yes. And here we can see it, it, it kind of backs it up, right? It looks akinetic to me as well as the inferior section. And that fits with the circumflex coronary artery territory, which is why the the, the um, pillory muscles going. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, uh, what about this one? So we're that's now at the, the basal. That's at the mitral valve level and uh, at the basal level of the uh, left ventricle. And again, confirming the same. So likely at the A two uh, area. Uh, at, at between A1 and A2 scallops, uh, there will be the papillary muscle rupture. Uh, no, so no. likely this will be the culprit area of the regurgitation. So that's again confirming this across the apical four chamber view. And uh, uh, I can clearly see a hyperdense, uh, hyperdynamic uh, postromedial, uh, postromedial papillary muscle uh, rupture uh, with hyperdynamic uh, anterior mitral valve leaflet, and uh, it's exceeding the coaptation line uh, going into the uh, left atrial cavity. So what do you uh, expect? Left... I'm going to show you color Doppler next. What do you expect the color Doppler to show? So my expectations of the color Doppler that there will be a posterior directed uh, uh, mitral valve regurgitation likely between moderate and severe Fair with enough. left atrial dilatation as well. So that's again confirming this with a quanta effect. So that would be account for severe mitral valve regurgitation on color Doppler, and the the, the mitral valve regurgitation jet is uh, approaching uh, the posterior wall of the left atrium, and uh, again going across both uh, pulmonary veins. Okay, what is uh, what am I showing you here, and what does it represent? So that's here across the pulmonary vein, and uh, that will be the right upper pulmonary vein, and the uh, pulse wave Doppler across it, confirming that there is reversal of flow uh, consistent with severe mitral valve regurgitation. You demand. Um, uh, Moise, you're just starting this, aren't you? Just uh, looking through this, this is a really nice sort of trick for those who are just starting about how to try and determine if we've got severe mitral regurge. Uh, it's a really nice trick. So you can't fake this. This is why I like this. You know, it's not, it's not, you know, it's obviously dependent on Doppler angle. You've got to get the flows, but you can't fake it just sort of being off axis. And if systole is from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the T wave, what we can see here is we've got a lot of blood going below the line, which means that we've got flow away from the probe, which means that, you know, normally during systole, blood should be flowing into the atrium. But if you've got rip-roaring mitral regurge, blood actually goes the other way during systole because you've got so much blood coming back into the left atrium. And that means you get this flow below the line. And we call that the S wave. The S wave is normally bigger than the D wave above the line. But in this case, it's completely the other way, which is in keeping with severe mitral regurge. Nicely said. Um, thank you very much. Last one. Okay, so... That's pulse wave Doppler. Pulse wave Doppler across the mitral valve, uh, at the mitral valve leaflet tips, and 
that's confirming that there is a pattern of severe diastolic dysfunction that had been associated with this with e to a ratio 2.4 approaching in average to be more than two uh, mm -hmm. which is grade three uh, systolic dysf uh, diastolic dysfunction that will have to be placed in context of the current loading conditions and the current acute uh, myocardial ischemia good man uh, very nice. Done, Hatim. Well done. Okay, so just a last little thing, just to um, remind everyone, again, it's a little cartoon just talking about blood supply. Uh, this is blood supply is very heterogeneous. It is dependent on collaterals. And, you know, if you've got chronic ischemic heart disease, you know, other coronary arteries can start looking after other areas. But this is the general pattern that we kind of think about where the LAD sort of covers the front and uh, lateral section of the heart. The right coronary does the inferior and part of the sort of septal area and right coronary. And the circumflex does the lateral and branching around to the anterior, uh, to branch around to the inferior, and maybe can cover a bit of the anterior. So it's not hard and fast rule, but those are approximately where the blood supply comes from. Okay. All right, who That's is next? question, Sam. Hi, is that Sid? Just yeah, just going oh, back to that pulse Doppler at the mitral inflow, just going, yeah, yeah that one. So um, if you're assessing diastalgy on a severe mitral regurgitation, I'm not sure whether we would call yeah. it as a, uh, you know, grade three diastolic dysfunction. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I did actually, uh, I thought this one was going to show something else. I completely agree. And I guess this, this probably this uh, example would not be in the exam for that exact reason. What I thought this was gonna show when I, when I put it into the thing just now, I thought the mitral E wave was gonna be greater than 1.2. Yes. So tell me, what, so let's imagine, if you can imagine that that mitral valve E velocity should say 1.24 and 1.21 rather than 1.01, what would that mean then, Sid? That's a severe, I mean, that's one of the indirect signs of severe mitral regurgitation. Yeah. Why is that, because, what, is it, what does it show? Uh, it's it's all flow dependent. I mean, um, the the load dependent um, function, the pulse, the mitral flow, in, mitral inflow, because of the regurgitating flow, which is going back into the left ventricle yeah. during diastole, that increases the E wave velocity, um, and then that's why the E wave velocity goes beyond one point two, which is a indicator of uh, severe mitral regurgitation. Again, if you look at the uh, diastole in the mitral regurgitation. Uh, the e wave velocity probably is more than 1.5 that's where you can you know there's some kind of diastology uh, yeah good control. man yeah and i um uh and i, and I guess you've got to say that there's no mitral stenosis if you're if yes. you're going to use that though so you can only do it when you don't have mitral stenosis but i agree i think diastology would be a bit hard in this patient particularly yes. when they're hemodynamically done but i think what Adam said, you know, probably isn't wrong. It's greater than it's greater than two. It's certainly, I think you use the D cell time there as well, which is 177, suggesting that we've got as probably that's overestimated. It's probably more like 120, suggesting that you've got rapid, you know, equalization of pressures and things. So yeah, I, I agree. I think it'd be really hard to say it, but I, I put in a dodgy slide. So sorry, but that's what happens when you do it at the last. The other cases are great, Sid. You can have this one. So fever, six-year-old right, fever, zygous, loin pain, pyelonephritis, query pyelonephritis, now probably vasoplegic, uh, rapidly escalating anotropic requirements with a history of AF and hypertension, 60-year-old female. All right, this is the IM mode across the mitral inflow showing what closure of the mitral valve during systole. Um, sorry, closure of the... Yeah, mitral valve during, let me just think first. Nice. Um, this is a thickened um, enterosuttle and the infrolateral walls with the given history of hypertension. Nice. Um, when the coaptation line of the mitral valve is not midline, there's a probably a early closure of the mitral valve. Um, Go again. So talk to me about what's, so define systole for me on the ECG. So systole is starting from the QRS up to the T wave, which we can't Beautiful. see, obviously. What is but, the mitral but, valve? What's the mitral valve doing during systole? So it's closed. Nice. It's closed during systole. So fantastic. So um, what do you see here during... Systole. 
in the mitral valve. So it's moving towards the interoceptal wall, mm. and uh, it could be a possibly a reflection of the anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflet. Fantastic, um, and that's the yeah. coolest uh, pathology known to mankind because it's called what? So systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaf that may and potential reasons uh, ventricular hypertrophy and yeah, good man, good man. So right, we'll show you the real thing now, and. Yeah. I, we don't do a lot of M mode in the exam, so but I, I do love it. Um, not all the examiners do, because I think if you can do the M mode, you know echo. It's uh, it's a great way of sort of trying to put the you know the the motion what you're seeing against time. I, I think it's really nice. Um, so talk to me through about this one, okay? So she's an elderly lady, Eurosepsis. Actually, so sorry, she's not that old. How old, how old, how old is she? Seventy, I think it was. So, so she's not super. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's going on? Long axis view show, confirming the mode findings of um, um, left ventricular hypertrophy with, uh, on the interoceptor and the interlateral wall and the, anterior, and the anterior mitral valve leaflet, which you can see is going, uh, is moving towards the LVOT. And then there's a very small left ventricular chamber and very enlarged left atrium. Good job. Um, Good job. I want to, I wish, yeah, okay. Um, Apical four chamber view again confirming the a asymmetrical hypertrophy of the interventricular septum. With patient is in atrial fibrillation and uh, there is a systolic anterior motion, motion of the anterior mitral leaflet with a excessive redundant mitral valve leaflets, severely enlarged left atrium, um, small right ventricular cavity, and there is a possibly a um, uh, pacemaker lead going across or, or some, mm -hmm. some kind of uh, device going across the tricuspid leaflet. Now I'm going to show you color Doppler next. What do you expect to see with the mitral regurgitation? A mm, couple of things. One, there's going to be a um, turbulent flow across the uh, left ventricular outflow. Um, and second is going to be there's potentially a diastolic MR, which I would see, I would expect on this. Diastolic MR, hang on, talk to me about... I mean, MR, systolic MR, obviously. And systolic MR, MR, yeah. And yeah, describe yeah. to me a bit more about um, the systolic MR. Yeah, and that occurs mainly because of the uh, uh, venturi effect, the anterior mitral leaflet gets pulled into the LVOT and that creates a uh, coaptation defect into the mitral uh, leaflet, giving rise to the um, mitral regurgitation um, during systole. And tell me more about the mitral regurgitation. So as I showed you from those cartoons, just in that sort of first section, that we can get the mitral regurg can be either central or eccentric. And if it's eccentric, it can either go anteriorly or posteriorly. Yep. It's going to be, what do you uh, think? Yeah, I think it's going to be eccentric, posteriorly direct, directed uh, mitral regurgitation. Why? You're actually right with this one, but it's not normally like that. So normally it's anterior, right? Because if you've got, this is my anterior mitral valve, this is my posterior, right? If that's normal, and then suddenly it gets pulled in to the LVOT, that means the direction is in the, 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 the mitral regurge is in the direction of the, the leaflet that gets pulled away, right? Yep. So normally they say that classically it is anterior. And what I find interesting in the critically ill, particularly when you've got hypertrophy or septal knuckles and you're hypovolemic, is that we often see it going posteriorly. And I wonder whether that's because you're also getting a bit of, it's not just the, the they kind of both get pulled in, which means that it's, it kind of goes the other way. And the hyperdynamic LV I, probably- I would don't have, it. yeah. It's, so I don't, so classically, the, the classic teaching with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is you've got an anteriorly directed mitral regurg jet. And that's why they love it in the exams, because you know my next question is going to be is how do you tell the difference between MR versus the systolic anterior motion, right? And that's because it's an anteriorly directed jet, which means it's then hard to differentiate between the MR and the LVOT obstruction. Yeah. So, as I said, it's unusual, critically ill, predominantly posterior. I think it'd be lovely. I've never seen any papers or anything discussing that, but I think it's that's what makes sense to me. Um, and so I might just move on and just say, how are you going to tell the difference between the LVOT obstruction versus the MR? So Wait. looking at the shape of the spectral Doppler, this is the continuous wave uh, spectral Doppler across the 
might um, the left one is across the LVOT and the right one is across the LVOT as well. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. But the shape of the shape of the uh, the 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 dagger shape, which you can see on the left side, is classically associated with the late peaking. I mean, uh, jet, which is classically associated with the LVOT obstruction, and the mitral regurgitation jet is usually central peaking. Beautiful. Unless but it it's is a severe one. Super high, right? We've got here. We've got values in eight meters a second for your LVOT obstruction versus five for the MR. Surely that's around the wrong way, isn't it? Not possibly. Um, again, it depends on what level we are putting a pulse wave Doppler at. If it is at the level of flow acceleration or the obstruction, the, the values are going to be high. And, yeah, hang on uh, a second. We're in continuous wave Doppler here. There's no way that yeah, pulsed yeah, wave Doppler can do flows of eight meters a second. It can do two max. So it is probably capturing both mitral regurgitation and the LVOT obstruction because it's a continuous wave Doppler and there might be an overlap of the of both of the flows. Yeah, but hang on, remember that it's even if there's overlap of the flows, which is what we've got on that left image. Yep. Continuous wave Doppler just doesn't care where the flow is coming from. It's just going to show you what the maximum flow yep. is, right? Yep. So absolutely, we've probably got both flows in there, but it's the maximum flow that it can pick up. So just be really careful with that language. That's going to get you into trouble with the examiners, right? So you were doing brilliantly right up until you started talking about that. So don't get your pulse wave and your continuous wave yeah. mixed up. So if we're, in, if we're in meters per second over two, it has to be continuous wave. Pulse wave has the, you know, it's obviously black in the middle. This one is completely filled in. And you're absolutely right. The dagger shape is, the, is more synonymous with LVOT obstruction. And the parabolic shape is more like the MR. The velocity doesn't matter because you can just like in this example have ridiculously elevated pressures with LVOT obstruction. But let's have someone else just shout out. So what's the big difference there? So everything it said is said is correct, but it's not the one where the money is. What's the money that tells us that the one on the right is MR and on the left is LVOT obstruction? I'd say duration and interventricular relaxation. Beautiful. Beautiful. So it's all about the MR is much broader at the base. And if I had, if I could draw a line up down here, we'd see that it finishes later and starts earlier because MR doesn't have an isovolumetric relaxation or contraction time, which means that it starts later. The LVOT obstruction does. That's inside. It does have uh, isovolumetric relaxation and contraction. Okay. I probably knew that, but I just couldn't get the question probably. <laughs> but I still can't mark you high on that though. I can't, I can't give you your mark. So Sid yeah, knows yeah. that because he said it to me last week in the DDU Viva. So we should therefore let him pass the exam. Yeah, nice. So just, um, we love this question. Anytime you're going to see LVOT obstruction, know it's coming up. How do you tell the difference in LVOT obstruction? You just say timing and then the parabolic versus the um, saber tooth shape. Uh, and the velocities do not matter. Cool. Who's next? Uh, Moise, how are you feeling, Moise? You want to have a crack at one? Uh, let's see how far I can get, Sam. Good job. Okay, so 54-year-old woman. This is a great case. I love this one. So I get to bag out my cardiology colleagues. 54-year-old woman, elective admission for angio after a STEMI with an AKI. She was sent home to recover and then came back in. It was a difficult procedure because of an episode of bradycardia and there was some minor chest pain and they were concerned about a right coronary artery dissection. So there weren't any beds in, I think, the CCU. So she ended up coming to ICU just for observation overnight. And in the morning, there was a bit of a, maybe there's a toe thing going on. We decided to, sorry, maybe a bit of chest pain. I decided to do a toe. Take me through that. Have you done any toes, Moisey? I haven't done any toes yet. Oh, so this might be a little bit beyond me. Well, why don't we? I can't remember what the next case. Why don't we pull you back for the case after this, if you want? That, I think that makes more sense. Cool. Who's next on the list? Who have we got down here? Hi, Robin. I don't know you. My name's Sam. Hello. Hey, Sam. I'm a DDU emergency um, going through with Alyssa and VJ at the moment. So I'm really. Oh, fantastic. Do you, therefore, you probably don't need to do a lot of toes, or you just put yourself on mute. Sorry. Yeah, I can understand stuff, but I won't volunteer. I'm sitting, but I just the DDU emergency. Yeah, Thanks. No They're fabulous. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, I'll tell you what, then we'll go back up to the top. Ben Gahadi, back up with you, champ, if that's okay. 
So take me through this. So you definitely do need to know about toes. You should be able to smash this one out of the park. All right, sorry, can we go back? Except I wasn't watching the uh, stem because I was talking. Just do like the little text. So 54, she had a dodgy angio. She's okay, but they did have a right coronary. Um, they had a small right coronary dissection that they stented. Otherwise, yep. everything was fine. Nothing to worry about, Sam. Sorry, I don't have a bed. Just look after her for the night and we'll take her off your hands in the morning. But something didn't feel right, so I did a toe in the morning. All right, go. Cool. What do you see? Okay, so I'm looking at a mid-esophageal five chamber. Uh, that's a bit clunky in the imaging. Uh, Sorry, I mean, as in, uh, it's just jumping around a little bit. That's oh, all. that's the interesting. Oh, so you're not bagging out my imaging. You're just. Uh, if you did the scan, it's amazing. It's, it's, amazing. The, it's the internet that's causing the problem rather yeah. than my scan. Um, so this is a, it, it's a slightly off axis metasophageal five chamber. I can't clearly see the right ventricle. The uh, interventricular septum um, doesn't appear to be thickening at the basal segment as I would expect. Effect. Um, the mitral valve appears to be opening well, and I can't clearly appreciate the aortic valve opening. Um, I need to see more views. Um, Some follow-up is that? Yeah. Thank you. So we've now swung around to a three-chamber, and you've got a zoomed-in view at the top. So what I can see here is a centrally directed jet of aortic regurgitation, and there's a moderate amount of colour variance across it. And Given that she's had a right coronary artery stent, um, uh, I wouldn't expect there to be any significant abnormalities within the aortic valve, although I am mindful that she's had a dissection in the RCA. So whilst I can't see it here in these views, I'd be worried about um, uh, development of uh, pericardial uh, effusion, uh, and that can also lead into involvement of the aortic group. But I can't see anything Can you here. see a pericardial effusion on this one? Look, I don't believe that that's a pericardial effusion in the in, uh, inferior in the segment to the aortic valve, but um, I'd need to see it uh, in, I need to see a color box deeper because there may be leaking through, but I can't quite be sure. What I can see under the lower segment of the aortic root is a flash of red and a color Doppler, but I'm not sure what I'm picking up there. Do you mean in there? There, yeah. Yeah, what's so that? Cool. So, so that is the... Right. Not pass. Got to go back to my anatomy. Coronary sinus. Here. What's this thing here where the red bit is? Where my where, what, what, am I, what am I pointing at with my uh, with my cursor there? Can you see my cursor? Yeah. What's that? So you. I'm going to guess. Is that the catching the pulmonary valve? Very good. Yeah. Excellent. So that is the pulmonary valve that's sitting there at 120, 130 degrees. Yeah. So that is completely normal flow and systole that's coming towards the probe, right? Yeah. Blue away, red towards. So you've got, because it's the right current, the right ventricle that comes around there and is pushing blood towards the main pulmonary artery, right? Yep. So yeah, just get anatomy. That that's yep. that's gonna scare examiners, okay? So yeah, that's yeah. the pulmonary valve that you've got there. That is a completely normal flow. But what we're seeing here is you've called it central. That's why I've got this one up here. I don't think it's central. I think that's eccentric. It's just, it's not, it's not going, it's not in your plane. It's going out of plane in an eccentric right. manner. I think that we've got some, probably it'd be nice if I'd given you a, I think maybe I got on the next one. No. We've got some, something does not look right about this valve. Yep. This is not a valve that's nicely closing in the aortic valve. This almost looks like we've got some kind of disruption. It almost looks like there's a like a some kind of prolapse that's going on there. Yeah. I think it ends. This regurg doesn't just go straight across. It looks like it just blunts down. Stop. Yeah. Yeah. It sort of stops there. But it also looks like it's got a big base. And that's yep. going to make you think that this is just, I guess all, all I'd be expecting as an examiner is someone to look at that and say, that is not right. Yep. Something is very wrong with this picture. It's got 2D, does not look normal. The color does not look normal. There's a broad base to that regurge, and it looks eccentric. For a lady who was otherwise well with no problems, something acute has happened. 
The big thing also for me is about the LV function here. Yeah. This is pretty close to hyperdynamic function. So again, we've got someone who's now ticking along. Don't forget your rate. Don't forget this is Lady Post Angio, who is now tachycardic with a hyperdynamic LV function and a neurotic valve that does not look right. Okay. So after an angio, we get worried about something acute that's happened. So what, what, what's going on? So we're now looking at, in effect, a modified three chamber with a greater view of the aorta. Most concerning feature here is what looks to be a dissection flap. Um, so I'd like to more thoroughly investigate the aorta to start with. Um, I'd like to see it in multiple views, but this is a significant concern given what you've just described. You know, she's day one post angiogram. Yeah. Uh, can you talk to me through about dissection flaps? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, dissection flaps, uh, separation of the intima uh, of the aorta from, from the uh, adventitia. You can have the presence of blood tracking up in through a dissection flap, which can expand it or make it larger. And um, dissection flaps can be something that you need to confirm because there can be many artifacts and can look like a dissection flap. However, in this case, the clinical context fits it. Um, you can be worried about a dissection flap because the blood can extend around and or tear through and cause a pericardial effusion um, as well. Nice. Uh, yep. uh, this can be a surgical emergency if the patient becomes additionally unstable. And, and what kinds have we got? You know, there are different ways of classifying it. And which Dissection, so it's in type A, type B, based yep. on the anatomy. So type A will extend from the aortic root up around to the uh, left subclavian and type B will uh, extend distally to that. So this is a type A. Very nice. Okay, so incidentally, by the way, just on this one, I think we might be seeing some kind of artifact or some kind of shadowing that's coming in here that might be from where the right coronary artery has been involved. I'm, yeah. I'm wondering whether that's where this artifact comes in, but that's just an incidental thing. I'm not 100% certain on this. Okay, so what do we see here? So mid-esophageal short axis view, and the most striking finding here again is what looks to be the presence of an echo-free space concerning for blood um, around the aortic valve, consistent with uh, dissection. Fantastic. What's that cusp there? That's the non-coronary cusp. Beautiful. How do you tell the difference between a true and a false lumen? There are a variety of ways. A true lumen will have blood flow through it uh, on color doppler, uh, which is the way that I'm most familiar with using. Um, a false lumen will have no flow or can have stagnant blood in it, um, so you don't pick up anything. You can have movement of the dissection flat. Well, that won't really help, actually. You know, that's what I've got, color doppler, blood flow. Yeah, not bad. Okay, this is looking at the descending aorta. Mm -hmm. So descending aorta, same patient. Again, the most concerning finding is the linear, what looks to be an artifact, but it will be a dissection flap in this case, um, extending down, I'm not sure how far down we are. I'd like to see color Doppler over this to 40, see with- 40 like, centimeters down. Oops. Uh, sorry, tough. See, yeah. I'd, like to see, uh, I'd like to see this with color over it to see if there's flow over both sides of that uh, flap, which I would expect there to be. What would you do? One, I'd look at the patient and see how she is, make sure her blood pressure and whatnot are okay. Uh, and also speak with the surgeon, speak with the cardiologist, cardiothoracic surgeons, cardiologists. Yeah, good job. The, um, and just to say this, the next level, typically they manage these things conservatively. If it's less than four centimeters from the aortic root. Um, I don't know why they choose that number, but that's the number that has been quoted to me. This is clearly greater than four centimeters and therefore needs the, to be with the length of the dissection. Yeah, so the length of the the length of the dissection from woe to go. Yeah. Here, if it's less than four centimeters, yeah. then they don't do anything about it. All right. There you go. Really? Yeah. Oh. Cool. So the risks obviously of doing the operation are much greater, but this one's an absolute stomp. So you know, and they might need to even go as far as Bentles procedures with these because, you know, the aortic valve is getting disrupted. Yeah. The section flap, it moves things around and she needed a whole Bentles procedure. Yeah. Right. 
from a minor non-STEMI. Pretty serious, huh? Um, okay, uh, Sid, you want to go next? 55-year-old man with shortness of breath and PND, probably chronic heart failure. That's the story tells me. Confirming the finding, uh, apical four chamber view showing um, dilated, severely dilated right ventricle. I can't see the free wall of the right ventricle, but the apex is made by the right ventricle primarily. There is a uh, hypertrophied or prominent moderator band. There is a large coaptation defect of the tricuspid leaflet uh, with very severely enlarged right ventricle, which is pushing the atrial septum onto the left side. The there is a um, septum which is deviated to the left side along with the smaller, uh, relatively smaller left ventricular cavity. Tell me more about the tricuspid valve. So tricuspid valve is fixed, immobile, and a very large coefficient defect on this view. But I would want to confirm that in different views because I can see some artifacts, probably reflection of the of the moderator band, I suppose. What do you think the tricuspid regurge is going to be like? What do you, I'm gonna show you a color Doppler next. Mm, it's probably gonna be central. Yeah, anything else? And it's gonna be low flow because there's probably gonna be a free flowing tricuspid regurgitation with radicalization of the velocities across and a very low flow tricuspid regurgitation. Nice. So what view is this? This is, um, um, Parasternal long axis view with uh, which is like um, uh, tricus or, or the right ventricular inflow view um, when you move the the cursor angle angle the cursor this is showing again free float free flowing tricuspid regurgitation across the tricuspid leaflet free flowing very nice so um, here's our here's our Doppler which is confirming this is a continuous wave Doppler across the Tricuspid leaflet showing a um, early peaking at triangular shaped um, tricuspid um, inflow velocity. All the triangles in Doppler are wrong. <laughs> That's what my kind of um, thing is. But yeah, <laughs> all triangles are wrong. <laughs> all triangles are wrong. So this is early peaking and a rapid equalization showing the rapid deceleration Very good. of the of the, of the tricuspid regurgitation. That was so nice. I think this that equalization seems to always happen before the end of systole, right? Yeah. Just yes. it's a, it's an incredible yeah. The early cutoff sign is another way of describing it. But you said rapid equalization of pressure. That's fantastic. Okay, what else? What, was, what about this? Expecting that this is the hepatic inflow um, at the sub subcostal view, which which is showing the 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 stolic flow reversal across the hepatic veins, and um, and that confirms the severe tricuspid regurgitation. The IVC I would want to measure. It's probably dilated, I presume. Yeah. Um, but this is confirming the severe tricuspid regurgitation. What's the image on the right showing us? On the right side, this is the aliasing across the. It's not aliasing. Yeah. It's not aliasing. Probably the mirror. I don't know. Just a color so, flow across the tricuspid. So this is the, the hepatic, vein. hepatic vein, and this is what we're imaging with the pulse wave Doppler. Yeah. And remembering. Yeah. Um, you know, in true sort of respect to the Simpsons again, Bart Simpson is also showing Doppler, which is his blue shorts. So it's blue away for Bart, blue away, red towards. He had the red top, blue shorts. So red is coming towards the probe, blue is going away. So Bart Simpson. And so the red towards means that you've got flow during systole. Flow is towards the probe, which is what we're seeing here. With this flow above the above the line, and if that flow is towards the probe, it's going the wrong way during systole because normally it should be flow should be coming out of the hepatic vein into the IVC into the right atrium. That's what normally happens during systole because you get filling of that right atrium. So if it's going the wrong way, and the, just the one line you just didn't give me, but I think you meant you said it's the severe TR, right? It's so that is off the charts. So yeah, I think you said uh, you know free flowing. I think no, I, I said severe. You, I said the, when when you said the. Do apologize. Um, I would have, yeah. I'd have given you the mark anyway, because you said free flowing. But yeah, so those are all the signs. This case is absolutely beautiful. What is the pathology? I, I probably would not ask you this in the exam, but just for interest's sake, um, what can anyone tell me what pathology we're looking at here? And I just want to uh, just say big up to this uh, uh, Dr. Woolauer, who put this through into case the other day. 
This is my guilty pleasure. I don't know if any of you guys look at Case, um, if you're members of the ASE, but if you like Echo, each month they um, bring out a journal called Case or Case Studies from the ASE, the American Society of Echo. And they have about six to eight of the most incredible, beautiful studies. And I'd really love Australia to try and submit more. I wanna, it's like my favorite magazine in the world, this thing, it's just brilliant. What's the, um, so what's the pathology? So I don't think it's from coming from the left ventricle because the left ventricle seems to be normal. I can't see any very obvious mitral um, pathology, though it might be foreshortened. Sorry. Keep going, keep going. Um, it could be coming from the lung, whether it's a primary pulmonary hypertension or a secondary pulmonary hypertension from some other condition, but there's a very prominent moderator band reflecting severe pressure overload of the right ventricle. Yeah, nice. Almost, almost. It's um, and, say again. And also, sorry, the, the leaflets are, Also, yeah, yeah, the leaflets are leaflets are very fixed. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So that's the uh, mnemonic for the, yeah. for the carcinoid. carcinoid. I've never seen yeah. one of these, and that's why I wanted to stick it in because it is just the most beautiful case for carcinoid. Very nice. I agree. No, you're done. You're done. I'm coming. Done I'm in the middle of a meeting. Okay. We're done. Yes, we're done. Yeah. Was it a question for Echo? Hi, kids. Uh, we got time for one more. Not really. It's three o'clock. I'll save this one for next time. Um, all right. I think that's a. Let's leave it at that. Uh, nice one, guys. That was. Um, that was great. I hope that was useful. Sam, that was great. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Yeah, great, Sam. This should be great. Well, we'll go through, I, I think I, I've got another couple of sessions maybe before the exam in August. Otherwise, I think next week and the week after, I think we're going back to sort of just ordinary lectures and I'll do some written questions after that. What I might do for those candidates as well who are sitting in a, in a few weeks time, I'm going to send an exam now. So a written exam, uh, have a go at that as well as some weekly questions and we'll, you know, good luck. 90 minutes for the exam? Uh, uh, so you've got 10 questions, two and a half hours. So it's oh. it's 15 minutes per question, basically. So you've got 10 questions, 15 marks per question, 150 marks. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Thank Good you luck, so guys. much. Nice to see you. Okay, see you bye. later. Bye. See you. Okay, bye. bye. If you learned something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.